Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video. Uh, today's video is going to be the start of a new series of videos I'm going to be doing uh, as part of these weekly discussions. This one is going to be the first one where I discuss The Promise, but the overall series is going to be basically be me discussing each of the completed comic series as we build towards the completion of North and South Part 3, which is coming up in about 5-6 weeks. So, this week we do The Promise, next week The Search, the week after that The Rift, the week after that uh, Smoke and Shadow, and then we're building up to preview stuff just prior to the release of North and South Part 3. So, I really want to reflect on where the comics have been, what we've had so far, as we move into, you know, whatever's coming next. So, Let's kind of uh, jump in here and kind of explain uh, the way we're going to be doing this. The The main thing with this is that it's not necessarily going to be a review. It's going to kind of be a mix between part review, part discussion, part just a kind of explanation of what actually happens in The Promise. I'm going to try and focus a little bit more in on the important plot details of the book rather than kind of going through every single thing in detail. So I'm going to be cutting out a lot of the stuff that just isn't particularly important and just getting to the details, the important details of that. So in that sense, like if you're, if you haven't read the books in a while, it's, it's potentially going to be a good video to just, you know, laser focus you in on what the promise was actually about, what were the key things that happened, and so on. <clears throat> so, uh, the, the, the promise being announced was obviously a big thing within the fandom. Uh, in around the time when it was announced, you know, Korra was on the verge of coming out, starting. So we were in a great point as Avatar fans, where we had a new show coming out in Korra, and also the announcement of the continuation of ATLA with these comics. Dark Horse had previously released The Lost Adventures, which is, was a collection of comics set during the show. This being the continuation afterwards was the first attempt by Dark Horse to release a original new story continuing the show. And I think now it's one of those things where you look back on it and it tends to be the forgotten comic. It tends to be the one that is the most dismissed, the most criticized, and the most forgotten. And I don't think that's really right because I think there's so many good aspects of The Promise, really, really important and well done moments in The Promise that they should be noted and remembered. I think there's some excellent parts of this book as we'll get into. And for some reason, they tend to just be forgotten because of some of the weaknesses of The Promise. I still probably would say it is probably the weakest, and you can sort of tell that it is the first attempt. There's a learning process going on here as they get used to doing Avatar comics within this format, um, as Jin Yang gets used to writing the characters and so on. But I don't think it is. it has so many criticisms that it's one that you should skip. A lot of people, when they recommend the comics to people, say, oh, skip the promise, just go straight into the search, that's the important stuff. I'd, I'd say no. The promise is important with what it covers, character-wise and plot-wise, and I think, you know, it's definitely worth checking out. So, let's get into it now and uh, really get to the root of one of what's happening here. So, where is the promise set? The promise, the first scene of the promise is set immediately after the end of ATLA. We get basically the setup the, uh, to the final scene of ATLA where Aang and Katara kiss out in the balcony and the aftermath of that. Then we could ahead to a year later, which is where the majority of the promise takes place, minus a few flashbacks on Zuko's side of the story. So immediately we're dealing with our characters as being. You know, from the start of ATLA, more or less two years older. This is 14-year-old Aang and in or around 18-year-old Zuko. So they're a little bit older, but they're still very young characters to be in such high positions in the world. In terms of like Zuko as the leader of the Fire Nation, as they enter an era of trying to prove that they're not evil anymore, to be more peaceful. Aang as a very young avatar who has proven himself in terms of bringing balance back to the world to a degree... And now it's just a matter of him adapting to the more problem-solving, almost political side of things now. And how does such a young character deal with that side of things? He's proven himself physically able to resolve these conflicts. But now, how do his uh, actual ideals stack up against everyone else's? And then the other factor in this is obviously Earth King Kuei. Um, because of ATLA and uh, our, our character's involvement with him, he is now properly the leader of the Earth Kingdom 
but he has very little world experience because of what happened with Long Feng and the conspiracy within the walls and him not knowing about the world or exploring the world all that much. So he has a very different perspective on things as well. So effectively we've got three very inexperienced leader characters trying to deal with what they think is just going to be a very peaceful end to the war. They just fix the last couple of things that are problematic in the world and everything will be fine. Not realizing that there are problems. And as we're presented with in the first, um, the first scene of the comic, the key issue is the Fire Nation colonies. Now, these colonies, for anyone wondering, predate the Hundred Year War. These are Sozin's first moves towards being the power-hungry character. As we see in the Avatar and the Fire Lord, it's the first thing that causes an issue between Sozin and Roku, is Sozin deciding that he wants to spread the prosperity of the Fire Nation to the other nations, and Roku does mention that he entered Earth Kingdom territory and has begun to kind of take it over. That is these Fire Nation colonies. These colonies exist or basically, like the, Zuko says later on, older than Aang. So they're over 112 years old. I suppose roughly we can say 120 years old, give or take. So these are very kind of... This, these colonies, these towns have existed for a long time. And as we later learn in the comic, they're actually very prosperous towns. Because they are the one of the, some of the few towns within the entire world that mix nations... Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation in this case, they're actually very prosperous because they're bringing the ideals and philosophies of two nations uh, together. And the issue then becomes, the, the, this is the, the ultimate issue within this book, can you just say, okay, the war's over, the Fire Nation caused all these problems, they took over Earth Kingdom land, do we now immediately give this land that the Fire Nation to some extent have control over back to the Earth Kingdom get rid of all the Fire Nation people from the places that they've lived in for over a hundred years, or do we just let it be? The Fire Nation were completely unjustified with what they did in the war, but because this has existed for a time, we just leave it as it is. The Fire Nation have part of the Earth Kingdom, it's fine. Either way, you can see problems. King Kuei is not happy with um, basically part of his nation, his landmass, belonging to the Fire Nation, and Zuko obviously isn't particularly happy as as he later comes to realize with the fact that they're just planning to move out all of these families which have many generations living in this place and you're just going to get rid of them because the war is over. And that's the key issue here as everyone tries to deal with. Zuko deals with the fact that he is um he still struggles with making the big decisions. He is he's managed to make the key decisions with regards to himself getting himself in the right position, what his destiny is. But now as a world leader, how does he actually handle, you know, doing these decisions when he's actually tasked with them? And initially he's just like, oh, uh, Aang thinks that, um, agrees with with the king and that we should go ahead with this harmony restoration movement, which is peacefully bringing the people from the Fire Nation that are, that live in these colonies back to the Fire Nation and, reverting control of these places back to the earth kingdom that seems to be the the what everyone agrees to but as zuko comes to realize when he actually visits this place the people are entrenched here this is such a wealthy town it goes beyond just fire and earth nation and while he doesn't fully get to the point of of realizing the importance of it being a mixed town he's primarily taking this more from the perspective of people from my nation live here and have lived here for a long time as their leader i have to fight for their rights to live where they've lived for so long even if potentially originally it was unjustified because of the war and you can see him struggling with this because he's 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 adapting to being a leader for the first time plus he already has this built-in issues within himself of struggling to make these decisions as we learn and with zuko's arc it primarily comes down to the fact that he is kind of taunted in a way by Ozai to come to Ozai for help with regards to being a, a, a good leader. And he ends up going to Ozai behind everyone's back. And this is kind of what ends up turning everyone against him. And this is where coming back to the first scene of the comic, it's very important because of what Zuko says to everyone. Prior to, just prior to the one year time skip, Zuko basically asks Aang, uh, he basically says the following, um, 
He says, if you ever see me turning into my father, I want you to, I want you to end me. And he says, you know, even now, after everything that's happened, my family's legacy is still a part of me. That's why it's my duty to heal the scars that the Fire Nation has left on the world. But the Fire Lord's throne comes with a lot of pressures. And if I'm honest with myself, I need a safety net. The world needs a safety net. That's why I need you. That's what I need you to be, Aang, the safety net. And Aang is obviously, we know he doesn't, he has no interest in killing people. So he's like, no, we're friends. There's no way I would kill you. And... He basically just says, you know, do this for me, make me a promise, Aang. And Aang eventually agrees to this after the kind of, you know, looking at Katara and she says agree to it. So the idea here, as Ji and Yang mentions in annotations in the Promise uh, hardcover library edition, what he's, the, the concept that he's toying with here is the idea of, okay, Aang versus Ozai was basically just that everyone expected him to kill the Fire Lord and it be justified because it would end the tyranny of a ruler. But what if you bring in the idea of consent? What if a guy is potentially like, I think I could become evil at some point. Kill me if it comes to that. How does that factor in? Like if he, from his friend in a clear moment, is asked, would kill me if I ever go out of line? How does he deal with that? And it's Aang being forced into this situation again where he has to tackle the idea of as the Avatar he's expected to kind of put everything aside to be the Avatar but as the last airbender he has to keep his philosophy and his culture alive and that involves you know treating all life with respect and not killing anyone. So he's in this really tough position where he wants to find a way to eventually bring the air- airbenders back keep the airbender culture alive but if he is too far into being the Avatar in the way everyone wants him to be, he's losing all of that. And so you can see the issue with both of our main characters and what they're struggling with here. That the Avatars are asking Aang to basically agree to this promise with Zuko, kill him if he goes out of line. And Zuko is struggling with the fact that everyone wants him to side with the Fire Nation in in this, but he feels he should side with Aang. And it comes into this whole situation of just, does Zuko trust himself enough to kind of trust his own uh, decisions and like is Aang actually as like who, who Zuko's basing his own opinions off is Aang in a good position to like deal with his his opinions because he in a way is is uh, arguing with the past lives about like the way to approach this so it's a very uh, delicate situation as we get here and then Quay is in a situation where he's really trying to prove himself like he hasn't been a proper leader for so long now it's his first chance to properly do something as the leader of the Earth Kingdom and get part of his land back. And he's really like set in stone on this. This is why he proposed the Harmony Restoration Movement. But he doesn't, he's never been to Yudao. This part of his own nation he's never been to and he doesn't know anything about it. So he's kind of uh, ignorant in it to a degree in the situation. But um, the next important part, really, as this starts to come into play and, you know, Zuko goes to kind of visit Ozai, is um, Aang talks to Roku. And we get this interesting discussion between the two of, like, Roku's constantly like, okay, you're still dealing with the consequences of my indecisiveness, Aang. You know, you were right to make this decision with Zuko, you know, and, and Aang's doubting himself. How am I supposed to kill my own firebending teacher, my friend? What kind of kind of person would I be? And Roke is just like, no, to make amends for everything that happened, you have to do this. And it comes up again, do you regret not killing Fire Lord Sozin? And Roke is just like, yes. Looking at it all, I let him away with it because he was my friend. And because of that, the world burned. You can't allow this to happen. Zuko, in a very clear moment, asked you to kill him if he ever goes out of line. You have to agree to it. This is different because Sozin never gave me this chance. So Zuko, at the very least, is giving you a chance to kind of, you know, be justified in this. Agree to it. And Aang is kind of like, uh, okay, but we'll we'll talk. We'll talk to Zuko. Even though he's re- withdrawn his support of the Harmony Restoration Movement now, um, we need to talk. So he and Katara go in. And eventually, th- what the talk actually ends up being about is about Yudao. It's about the fact that this place has existed for more than 120 years uh, as a Fire Nation colony within the Earth Kingdom. It is a very prosperous place. And even though the Fire Nation people are more wealthy than the Earth Kingdom people here, it's still a very, very wealthy and you know popular city within the world. And... The issue really begins to come up here in that like Aang is basically 
all in on the Avatar philosophy of the four nations must remain four. That is part of keeping balance in the world, uh, that no nation takes over any other nation. And it's at this point that uh, Katara sees uh, Kori's family. So Kori, Morishita, two of the kind of more leading, uh, the, the leading family basically within Yu Dao. And the thing here is that um, we get this unique dynamic where Kori's mother is an earthbender and an earth kingdom woman. Her father is a Fire Nation man. And she herself sees herself as being more of a Fire Nation citizen, even though she's an earthbender. And she's also dating Sneers, who's from the Earth Kingdom. So, just with this one character of Cory, she is presenting this idea of the positives of the world coming together. Couples from different nations coming together and having people whose uh, national identity doesn't necessarily reflect who they are as a person. And it's so interesting, and kind of Katara at this point proposes the idea that will eventually over a long time become from Korra the United Republic uh, Republic City maybe Yu Dao can be an exception to the four nations maybe it can be a nation to itself um, a place that is not part of the four nations and they begin to think about this but they're like oh, I don't know if that can really happen so there's that and what we get at the very end of this is that Zuko continues to struggle with this a lot and eventually goes to see Ozai he gives in to his doubts and goes to see Ozai to get advice on how to be a better leader. Because I suppose the idea being that if there's one thing Zuko knows that Ozai was, he was a good leader. Even if he maybe made the wrong decisions and like was a tyrant, he was respected by his people as a leader, even if it was maybe for the wrong reasons. So... Um, we get a lot of interesting situations here. But anyway, uh, as we progress, we get another kind of side plot presented into the story. And that is obviously the idea of Aang wanting to find some way to keep the airbender culture alive. And when they when they arrive, you know, in basically, you know, Yudao, they, they realize that there is a, a Avatar Aang official fan club. And it's run basically by people who are all very interested in air nomad culture, primarily because of Aang. But they have honestly taken an interest in airbender culture. And they're like amazed to see Aang there. And like he, he's he's actually really excited that, about that so many people are taking an interest in his culture. And they've, you know, they, they may not know everything in detail about the air nomad culture. But they've, they've found like the symbols, certain relics of the air, airbenders. And, you know, he's really happy to kind of explore all of this. And get a chance to do this thing which hasn't really been around in so long. Um, on the other side of the story, what Zuko and Ozai talk about is fascinating in that it's it's Ozai trying to basically show Zuko like, no, this is the way to rule. As the Fire Lord, the key thing in being a Fire Lord is this. When it comes to making decisions, it's not about like, uh, I think this is like the morally right thing to do or this person thinks that or that. No, whatever way you think is correct. Because you're the Fire Lord, because you have that position of power, your decision is automatically correct. That that's the way Ozai ruled. He just said, whatever my decision is, it's final. I'm not basing it on anything or like what it should be or dealing with any conflicts within myself. I have a position of power. That's the way it is. Um, and it presents this idea in the past of um, when the when the family was at the beach when Zuko was young, he encountered a... Um, a, he encountered the hawk attacking a turtle crab in the water and he really struggled with what to do in this situation. Should he let the, the, the hawk, who has the advantage in this situation, get its food and survive? Or should he protect the weak turtle crab from being killed by this hawk? And this represents basically the conflict within Zuko. That he never knows whether to side with the position of power or fight for the people who are weaker than he is. And it's this struggle that he always has within himself. And Ozai's obviously solution to this is that, no, it's not about what is morally correct, siding with the, the, the powerful people or siding with the weaker people. Your decision is right by default. Um, we then cut, away, cut to the other side plot of the, of the promise, which is um, the Toph and her metal bending school. Now, I suppose this would be the main problem with the promise in that part two of the promise 
is taken up far too much by the metal bending school plot, which ultimately isn't particularly important, even if, you know, the the metal bending students eventually do kind of come back and are presented as reasonably, you know, interesting characters. Um, but there are a few things to take away here. One is just an interesting moment of, like, how did um, Toph basically find all of these people? How did she find out that they were actually um, metal benders? And it's revealed that her meteorite bracelet that she got in book three uh, during Sokka's Master actually shakes a bit because she wears it on her arm. It actually shakes a bit when she's around earthbenders who are very emotional. And she discovered that basically that, oh, that that's what it means. It's basically alerting her to the fact that someone has the potential to be a metal bender because they have an influence on the meteorite, which is made of metal. Uh, the, the, this being the idea of like Katara in the first episode of Avatar, when she got emotional, her water bending was very powerful, even if she necessarily didn't have a lot of control over it. She was able to actually do quite powerful things with her water bending, even if that wasn't uh, necessarily the case. So we then cut back to the um, the fan club situation here, and we see that Katara is with Aang while he's experiencing the the fan club, and he's having a great time. They present him. A, a traditional music instrument of the air nomads and he starts using that and the the, the issue that Katara is having here is that the fan club is all girls and she thinks that Aang is enjoying it because of the female attention um, and he's kind of ignoring her when in fact when they leave what Aang says is interesting in that um, he says I know it's just a silly fan club but for a moment there it almost felt like I was at home again with my people thanks for agreeing to stay there for the night sweetie it meant the world to me so it's this idea that he wasn't there because it was all girls. He was there because he was so happy to have people who you know, were interested in his culture. It felt like home again, which obviously he hasn't experienced for a very long time. And it makes Katara feel awful that she was beginning to feel jealous of Aang just loving all the girls' attention. When in fact, she kind of realizes at this point, I haven't been showing a lot of interest in his culture. When he's brought up the fact that he's the last airbender... What have I, like, done to, like, help him with this? Like, as his girlfriend, have I in any way shown an interest in, you know, his his aeronomic culture and, like, learning about it? And he says, she says, you know, don't thank me, Aang, I don't deserve it because she was feeling jealous. And, you know, ultimately it's a plot point that mm, doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Kakara seems to show a little bit more interest in it and that she at least hangs out around the air acolytes when Aang is kind of um, teaching them. So it's just this idea that she is learning bits and pieces of this culture that she knows she's going to be a part of in the future, as we'll get to. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we go through more of uh, Aang, uh, uh, Ozai and Zuko talking, and we eventually get to, obviously, Quay and his big decision here later on when Aang and uh, Katara bring up the fact that Zuko has his doubts and we think they're quite reasonable about Yu Dao because of how long it's been. But he's basically just like, I've been weak all my life. My most trusted advisor was able to keep the war a secret. I have to make a big decision here. And he's basically like, if Zuko doesn't join me, we're going to war. And so the end of the promise part two is effectively that the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom are going to war over this decision. That the Fire Nation won't support the Harmony Restoration Movement, but the Earth Kingdom is supporting it and wants the people out of the Fire Nation colonies. Um... The last, I suppose, primarily important bits of The Promise Part 2 are that the training of the metal benders isn't going well for Toph. She's tried everything she can, she's a tough teacher, but it's not going well. And she begins to realise the issue that she's had this whole time. And that is that uh, metal is basically earth that's been refined under pressure and pain. And that really describes how she felt um, when when, when she was with her parents. She was expected to be this cultured, well-mannered, soft-spoken little lady. All she fe- felt was pressure and pain to be something different. She felt pressure to become er- from to change from earth into metal, to be something that she wasn't. And that's kind of what she's doing to her students right now. She's overly pressuring them and they're on the verge of leaving. But them listening in on her having this conversation with Sokka actually spurs them on to stay because she sees kind of how pas- they see how passionate she is about metal bending. So it's uh, very interesting. Um, but yeah, the, the end of the promise part, the, the key last bit is just that May, Zuko's girlfriend of course, um, 
finds out that Zuko's been meeting with Ozai. And she breaks up with him because he's keeping all this stuff from her. And this is a breakup that's still in place to today, though realistically they're probably going to get back together very, very shortly. So Zuko is in a very bad situation going into part 3. He's struggling with what Ozai is telling him during their meetings. He's struggling with the fact that Mei has just broken up with him. He's having these issues with Aang and Katara over his decisions. The war war is just about to break out. He's really, really struggling as a leader. And he thinks he's wrong about everything. And we move into part three. And we see that with Aang... He's struggling with it too. That the whole idea of like his philosophy uh, of the Air Nomads. But... In helping the world, he's expected to like kill Zuko for this decision that he feels is affecting the kind of fate of the world. But if he does that, he will have basically like almost in a way removed himself as an air nomad because having killed someone, it doesn't really represent what he's meant to be anymore. And it's it's kind of fascinating as everyone begins to come together as the war is just about to break out. You know, the Ang interferes in this and basically is just like. You know, he goes into the Avatar state. He he's about to end Zuko in a way, until Katara kind of stops him. He's kind of just like, it was such a simple plan. Why couldn't you just follow it through? And Katara finishes saying to Aang what she was going to say earlier on before she was interrupted. She basically says, "On our first visit to Yudea, when I saw Corey's family, I also saw our future. If the nations have to be separate, what will that mean for us?" Um, and she just says, "You know, just." Before you commit to a decision about what to do with Zuko, think about it. Be clear in your decision, and I will trust whatever decision you make after that. Even if it means that we can't be together. And it's this really powerful moment from Katara where she's basically just saying, you know, the nations being four, what does that mean for our relationship? I'm from the Water Tribe, you're an air air nomad. If the nations have to remain separate, does that mean that we can't be together as a couple? Um, and it's just this this issue that that she she basically presents, and he meditates again and talks to Roku, and he basically talks about how much you know, he really loves being an air nomad and he can't turn his back on the philosophy, um, and you know Roku basically just saying you know the Avatar must hold the world above his own uh, nation, his own friends, his own family, and Roku reveals to Aang that Ursa is his granddaughter, which means that. To Aang, this is his first time learning about Zuko's relation to Roku. And he's shocked to hear that, like, Roku would be the one to actually, like, want Aang to make this promise with Zuko to kill him if he goes bad. And Roku basically asks Aang to, like, think about this in depth, you know, what what you need to do here. Um, And Katara's, like, key role right at the end of this book is to deal with Kuei. He is panicking in this war situation. He's he's there on the battlefield in a in a blimp above them, and he's revealed that you know up until a year ago I've never been out of I've never even visited my own city's outer ring, and Katara's like no you have to get out there get into the battlefield see you down for yourself only then can you properly make a decision and so uh, Katara brings Quay down to the battlefield and you know seeing such violence and stuff like that he he stops it and. Um, kind of realizes that um you know l- like everyone else is beginning to realize the world is becoming different the nations are beginning to come together to a little degree and that's not a problem that we can accept that to a degree he can accept part of the earth kingdom kind of not being part of the earth kingdom anymore if it's you know because of this kind of progress that's being made and um, what ang does though is he makes his decision he he basically separates Yu Dao from the Earth Kingdom. Uh, he doesn't like completely like make it its own island, but it's it's a separate landmass to the rest of the um, the Earth Kingdom. He saves Zuko, who who actually falls off during the situation, and Zuko thinks when Ang is coming to get him that. Aang is going to fulfill the promise and kill Zuko at this point but instead he saves Zuko from falling into the ravine Aang just made and effectively Aang's decision is that he is for the nations kind of merging together in a way that you know the whole illusion of separation thing is very important to Aang and so he makes the decision to you know separate Yu Dao from it and it effectively becomes a fifth nation of its own where it has its own, it's governed by its own people, and so on. And the implication is that over time, 
this place eventually becomes the United Republic, though we're still a bit away from that actually happening. And the representation that they present to um, Quay is basically just that the two relationships here, Sneers and Cory as Fire Nation and Earth Kingdom together as a couple, and then Aang and uh, Katara as a Water Tribe and Air Nomad couple, that these relationships are important and it only happens if we're not separating everything the way it is. So the conflict comes to, a, to, to an end and Zuko realizes that like, wait, after everything that happened, I was right. The decision I made to side with my people to keep them where they were was right. And he just collapses under the strain of this decision that he realizes in the end he was right. Now, he was right to a degree, but like not completely right. Because his decision was made more to help his people rather than because of like the nations coming together type situation. But he begins to realize that come the end of the book. So the very end comes when Aang meditates and talks to Roku again. And he, he, he talks about how, you know, uh, like you said, I contemplated the world. And he says, you know what? I actually did see Katara, Sokka, Toph. I saw the Kyoshi Warriors, the White Lotus Society, um, the monks who raised me. I saw Zuko. I don't know how to contemplate the world without first thinking about the people I care about, including Zuko. And Roku says, by refusing to take decisive action, you continue to put the world at risk. And Aang just says, it's a new kind of world. There's no get, there's, there's no getting around risk. Avatar Roku, you've thought me so much. I couldn't have become the Avatar I am today without your wisdom. But everything's so different now. It's not like when you were alive. I have to figure this out on my own. Goodbye. As he basically, symbolically what he does, he, is he takes the fire medallion off his kind of... Uh, avatar necklace thing that he has that has the symbol of each nation on it and burns it he's basically saying that for now i have to be on my own i can't take this this much advice from someone who whose perspective comes from a different era roku's era is when the four nations were separate and there was no joining or coming together of them ang's era is different and so him taking such advice from roku who doesn't understand that things are changing is not correct. So it's, it's maybe a harsh decision for Mang to separate these ties, but for now, he realizes that he needs to forge his own path as the Avatar and not just rely on advice from the past lives. And we more or less end the comic with this really, really interesting conversation between Aang and Zuko. They're just in, um, you know, Iroh's tea shop talking to each other, and it's revealed that they, they're both having the same doubts about their leadership over the course of the book, and Zuko realizes that, like, I was wrong to ask you for the promise, you know, I, I made you my safety net, and that was just completely unfair, I couldn't, I can't put that on you, so it's, it's not a promise anymore, um, and then, from Aang, we get that, he basically says, you know, like, I'm flawed, I'm a flawed character too, you struggle with your decisions, I also struggle with things as well, and he says, you know, since Roku, uh, since Roku is my past life, in a way, uh, you're my family, Zuko. And no matter how hard I've tried, I've never been able to detach myself from those sort of bonds. It's a flaw, I know, but I've, de- but it's it's one I've decided to accept for this life at least. So Ang admitting that yes, he cares a lot about the people around him, and to a degree, it's going to be his flaw as an avatar that he he's going to struggle to put the world above the people around him but it's something he can just about do but his his problem has always been that he's overly attached to the people around him and that's that's that that's fine um and basically um zuko's like i'm still struggling within myself about my decision making and he's like maybe finding my mother would connect me to a part of my heritage that isn't so murky and confusing and we end with the setup for the search of Zuko going to see Azula in the mental facility and basically, you know, ask for her help to, um, you know, basically get information from Ozai so that he can find where Ursa is. Because it was revealed early on the promise that Zuko had asked uh, Ozai about Ursa, but he had, hadn't told uh, Zuko anything. But he feels that if he can get Azula on his side, uh, he'll tell Azula what he needs to know. And this is set up for the search. Zuko is trying to get past his final issues with decision making by resolving one of the key things left that's open in his life. Where his mother is, what happened to his mother, and that's that. So, that's the promise. It's, I think, a fascinating story about um, leadership, you know, compromise in a way. 
how to deal with the aftermath of the war and the situations that a war has left, it's a concept that I don't think a lot of people considered almost to a degree. And I feel that it was so impressive of how they actually managed to explore this. It's not a perfect comic. I think the Toph, uh, the the earth metal bending school versus the fire bending school plot takes up far too much of the book. It's I think it's poorly timed as well when it happens. It takes up too much of the middle section where the big stuff should be building where and it means that like part one and part three are very like separate to part two which is primarily Toph's side of the story so it's just little things like that um little kind of interactions that weren't you know dealt with perfectly but the, the overall core the takeaway i think is really well done because you get the world moving towards you know um United Republic, which is a plus. You get Aang and Zuko and Quay all dealing with their flaws as leaders, as leaders, as they kind of move into this new era of trying to bring peace. And it's just a, a, a nice setup of how, like, it made sense that this was what the first comic dealt with. It didn't just jump into Zuko's mother and forget that, like, the world still needs a chance to recover after the war. And so having this like book address the end of the war was really, really nice to have. So, um, yeah, that's going to be the end of the video for this week. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on The Promise. Um, do you appreciate it as much as I do? Do you, um, you know, or do you agree that it's far and away the weakest of the comics and that people shouldn't read it? Um, I am definitely of the perspective that I think it is a worthwhile comic. It is absolutely required reading if you're an Avatar fan because it's... It, some of those scenes are so important. The Zuko Ozai stuff, the Aang and Zuko conversation at the end, the general character arc for Aang and Zuko over the course of this book in relation to the promise. It comes together so nicely for me. I think it's just absolute required reading. But yes, that has been the video for today. Next week we'll discuss the search. But uh, for now, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.